<laughs> All right. So um, yeah. So this is this is the game. Uh, well, the trailers don't. Uh, you get like YouTube will take it down because video, whatever. So yeah. So the okay. So. This game is like crack. I put a few hundred hours into this game and will probably put in a few hundred more. The devs are constantly pushing out new content to a point where all the server maintenance is starting to become annoying. And they are very involved with the community. Um, me and two friends of mine started off on a public server and had a really nice welcoming. A nearby Chinese tribe gave us some stuff to start out. We were hooked to the game pretty much instantly. There were some big tribe wars going on on the server, but we were left alone. A few weeks later, we have a huge metal base with five stone wall perimeters around it and five more people joined our tribe. All the big tribes, but the Chinese one left the server and got wiped out. And it seemed peaceful at this point. We already spent hundreds of hours taming different dinos, which each have their different role, like gathering resources, carrying heavy loads, transportation, combat, you name it. We eventually also tamed a few T-Rexes and the stronger end game dinos. You name them all because of their different tasks and stat builds. You become sort of attached to your dinos as well, which makes the game even better. <laughs> One week later, random smaller tribes are getting destroyed at night when they are offline. All the buildings blown open, resources stolen, dinos killed. Take note, some dinos can take over 10 hours to tame with kibble. At this point, our base is more like a fortress. We had over 70 organic turrets. Think plants that spit acid to hostiles. And 10... <laughs> auto Gatlin turrets and loads of ammo in them and an army of all kinds of dinos over 50 including T-Rexes varying from level 150 to 200 plus a full metal layered base with different compartments with different resources in every room makes it harder for raiders to get everything since they have to blow up more walls the Chinese tribe starts putting in random text in global chat in capital letters including our tribe name they have always helped us out we have had multiple trades with them for resources and called them allies the next day, I log in. Everything is gone. All of our dinos are dead. Every wall is blown up. All of our turrets taken out. And our base is in ruins. Hundreds of hours of building up, taming dinos, training them, taking them out on resource runs, and working together with the tribe. Gone. The Chinese tribe who helped us out from day one destroyed us. Um, the empty, hollow feeling your base is in ruins and your tamed, uh, fed, and cared for dinos dead. I've never had that in a game before. Three days later, we set up camp a few miles west of our old base. We had a primitive tools, and we were back to square one. We were determined and longing for revenge. We broke down with some old metal walls and made a small 4x4 room and set up the basic crafting stations. We had good contact with a few of the smaller tribes nearby who helped us out countless times. Um, now we needed their help. We secretly banded together against the Chinese tribe, and they gave us some of the harder-to-obtain resources like crystal and oil. We started mass producing grenades. I went out at night with <laughs> I went out at night with a stash of metal tools, a crossbow, uh, arrows, and food, and approached their base. The Chinese built an enormous stone castle on the water where they stored most of their egg farm <laughs> dinos in. I went to I went to the beach, swam underneath the base, found a spot where I could hack away at the stone walls to get inside. Found a good spot and made a start. Tribe members brought over grenades and we blew through the wall. Out came charging a T-Rex and five raptors at insane speed. We started backing off while firing at them. The water slowed them down. Called for the rest of the tribe to head over. We ended up fighting them on foot with primitive weapons. <laughs> After a long fight, we took them out one by one. And eventually, they all laid dead. That feeling of vengeance is undescribable. <laughs> we were satisfied. We headed back into the dino pen and laid waste to their entire egg farm. We killed over 20 stegos, three mammoths, and a few acolos. It was a massacre, fueled by loss of our pets and friends. Today, we're still fighting a guerrilla-style war against the Chinese, constantly on the move, hitting them from where they expect it the least. <laughs> Only a handful of people remain on the server, but we won't rest until we have taken everything from them. Like they did so many others. <laughs> Doesn't that game sound amazing? <laughs> it's 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 called. Uh, oh yeah, he said he, he said his, his English. Sorry for his grammar. Apologies for the grammar mistakes. English is not my native language. Arc survival evolved. Well, yeah, I bu I just bought it on Steam. It's done downloading. Yeah, we should all have our that we should get a tribe and take <laughs> and take out the Chinese. <laughs> Doing it tonight. <laughs>
if you're going to get it, be at my house at 9.30. We're, I guess we're going to stream. <laughs> Plus, we get, the, uh, we get the saddle. Limited edition saddle if you uh, do the pre-release thing. Which just means that you can ride dinosaurs. I'm so excited. Thirty bucks. Man, what's that? <laughs> this must be one of the mating rituals. Goats in the game? Prehistoric goats. Ooh. It's going to be awesome. Quote. I will take care of the goats. All right. So. I'll just have a goat tribe. <laughs> no, one will, no one will mess no with me because I'll just think I'm just a wicked, way too weird. All right. How do we, what he's been doing? He said 50 goats over there for two, two weeks. All right, so homework assignment, you were supposed to... Shut up! Only I am allowed to talk about unrelated stuff. <laughs> All right, so homework assignment was to update PSQ um, for this else, add with priority, right? Is that, is that accurate? Right. Okay. Um, so when we're adding a PCB to one of our queues, last time we created this generic queue called a PCQ, a PSQ, and we decided that our uh, PSQ would uh, hold uh, three queues, low priority, normal priority, high priority. All right. And the fact that our PSQ is uh, um, reliant on some of the implementation of our PCB means that those two data structures are what? Relative to each other. What's the... With, Coupled, yep. So that's a software engineering term where we have multiple things that are reliant on each other and coupled has a, a negative connotation, but sometimes it's unavoidable. So we just randomly decided we'd have three states or three priorities rather. Uh, and then we have the global um, thing called the queues. And this queues is going to hold our three queues. So we added the low queue, then the normal queue, then the high queue. Um, so bucket zero will be the low queue, which happens to correspond with um, the priority low, which is zero. Priority uh, what normal is one, priority high is two. So the buckets of our the queues link up to that, so it should be relatively easy. So now when we add a PCB, the PCB is coming in. We ask, do you want us to add this with priority? If you say no, then we're just going to go ahead and add it to the normal queue by default. Okay. Otherwise, we're going to add it to the queues dot get um, which priority we're going to say PC. We're going to say P dot. We have an ability to get the priority. We don't, so we have to expand our PCB. to give a getter for our um, priority. All right, so let's go ahead and just, well, well, let's put it after the constructor. Go to source, generate getters and setters, and then we're gonna say priority, but we're just gonna give us a get for priority. <coughs> All right, so now we have a get priority. So then back over here in PSQ, we can say p dot get priority. So that'll we're gonna say give me the queue associated with the priority of this PCB, then add last to that queue the PCB. Make sense? So that would have uh, does that fulfill the homework? So now whenever we add something to our uh, queue. If we choose to add it with priority, it'll put it into the right queue. 
So let's go back to our process scheduler. And right now, what does our process scheduler do? It allows us to create a new PCB, and this would get called in response to like, uh, we double click Microsoft Word, then that's gonna tell the process scheduler where there's a new PCB being born. Realistically, we'd probably say which PCB, but right now we're just randomly generating them. So this guy figures out number of instructions. We say we're creating a PCB. We fill up the instructions with fake instructions. Um, this is where we actually generate the PCB right here uh, with the current uh, PID. We're also saying that if it's a brand new PCB, its parent is nothing. Okay, that's a top level PCB. Then we increment cur PID so that the next PCB we generate is uh, um, a, a unique number. Uh, then we're going to set that guy's priority to high. Then we're going to add him to the job queue without priority. That's what the second variable is, false. Okay. Then we So then we're going to say we added him <coughs> to the job queue. Then we're going to add it to the ready queue. So we're going to set the PCB state to ready add it to the ready queue and say add it with priority. So now that'll get put into the the high priority line. Make sense? All right, so now in our little simulator, processes or PCBs can be born and they're in queues. All right, so the process scheduler is in charge of putting things into the appropriate line. Who's in charge of getting things out of the appropriate line? So I think in the book, this call this this guy's called the long-term scheduler. So I call it the process scheduler. The other dude's called short-term scheduler. I call it the CPU scheduler. All right. So we talked about the CPU scheduler needing to be really, really, really fast. CPU scheduler feeds off the process scheduler, or feeds off those queues, right? Okay. And then what does he do? He feeds the CPU. All right. So, the CPU scheduler needs to have access to these queues, correct? Well, if we're gonna, let's go ahead and create a CPU scheduler just so we have the data structure for it. So go ahead and right click, we'll say new class CPU scheduler. Scheduler. Okay, so we have that guy. <coughs> uh, we need to go. Man, are you getting sick? Allergies. Yeah. See, I've been having. Is it really allergy issues right now? It seems like it, because like I don't feel sick. It's just. It shouldn't be, but I've been weird. sneezing all over the place and breeding dinosaurs. Tried to burn it out last night. <laughs> Didn't work. Um, oh, by the way, I sent you a, uh, a a comeback video of Evan Haxter and I with a. A little uh, refresher from New or from Chicago. I don't know if you saw it. Uh uh. Oh, you, should, you should watch it. It's on. It's in here. Uh, let's see. Is this chapter three? Yes. All right. So let's draw a picture of what we kind of currently have right now. C U W O S M. All right, so right now we have a process scheduler. <clears throat> Let's center the text of these guys. All right, we have a process scheduler. A process scheduler is effectively going to be a collection of PCBs all right so now even though it seems like we've written a whole bunch of stuff all we have is this a process scheduler which is a collection of PCBs and we can show right for right now we can just imagine visually what a PCB is right it doesn't it's not really part of our moving parts the living parts of our OS. So this kind of gets back to what we said that a PCB is kind of a, a container for holding information. It's not a living thing. So the only living thing in our operating system right now is this process scheduler. 
somebody is going to call upon this guy, probably our driver the, the, that we're using to simulate an operating system, is going to call upon this guy to generate PCBs initially and throw them into those queues. All right. Now we just created a CPU scheduler. All right, and right now he doesn't do anything. Okay, CPU doesn't do anything. Now in between here, <coughs> we have those queues. All right, right now those queues are encapsulated inside of our process schedule. They live in there. All right, but our CPU scheduler needs to have access to those queues. Okay, because he is ultimately going to be working with the CPU itself, this guy. All right, so he's going to feed PCBs to the CPU. What PCBs is he going to feed? Well, assuming we can give him access to these queues, He's going to feed off the high priority first, then the normal priority, then the low priority. So this guy's going to constantly be going back and grabbing the next PCB from, you know, the, 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 the proper place. Okay? So what we really need to do is we need to move these queues from inside process scheduler and move them into a place where it's accessible to both of these guys. And uh, what design pattern is that called? We haven't necessarily learned it in here, but other classes that some of you are in have learned about this design pattern. What's it called? Want to have an object that's global that with multiple classes? It's a singleton design pattern. Okay, so we're going to create a singleton that's going to have our cues in it. Possibly other things moving down the line, but for right now, let's let's kind of keep things as as modular as possible. So what I need to do is I kind of need to um, put a box around my cues. Oh. It's not designed very well, is it? And then house the queues inside that box so that both of those guys can have access to the queues. Make sense? All right, so let's go back here to our code and let's shift. Well, let's go ahead and build our CPU as well, just so we have all the data structures that we visually represented here. So we'll build a blank data structure for our CPU as well. We won't put anything in there yet just so we can keep our picture true to what we actually have. So I'll build a new class called CPU, and that's all that guy is right now. Okay. So now we go back into our process scheduler, and our process scheduler currently has these global variables that are of type PCQ. What we really need to do is we need to have a singleton object that houses the queues. Okay. So what we're going to do, and um, is this a good name for it? Well, we probably wouldn't uh, call it queues like that. We probably would call it, uh, well, what would that object be called that holds all of our queues? It's a container for queues. Q factory? Q factory? All right, so this guy's going to be a Q factory. All right. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to create a new class called Q Factory. And Q Factory is going to have these queues in it. So I'm going to move the queues from here. And we're going to put it into Q Factory. And these guys are going to become static. Can't be private anymore because we need to have access to them outside of here. Did you remove them from the process schedule? Yep. I 
cut them and pasted them in here. And now I'm making them static. What does it mean for a, uh, uh, well, first of all, let's do a little <coughs> Java review. What kind of animals are these guys? It's inside of a class. The possible members are fields, methods, constructors. Those are fields. So fields are our variables. These class fields are instance fields. Class fields, how do you know? Static. Okay, so how do we call static fields? Using the class name. So we would say qfactory dot the job queue, qfactory dot the ready queue, so on and so forth, right? All right, so we've just thrown these guys in a little container called qfactory that right now holds three queues. So now we'll go back to our process scheduler, and I'll go ahead and save, and we should have some errors now. Because now when we're putting stuff in queues, the, the way we're currently accessing our queues isn't the right way we should be accessing queues. Let's go down to our errors. So it's no longer this dot the job queue. Now it's queue factory dot the job queue. And it's queue factory dot the ready queue. That's where our queues live is in the queue factory. Make sense? All right. So first of all, I want us to kind of... Uh, um, let's see, do we have another guy? The job queue, the ready queue. Did you save the, did you save queue factory? When you save, don't push the single save. Yeah, you can do the save all, I know. It's so stupid that Eclipse works that way. Junky, junky software. All right. Um, what is the save all? Command A. Control Shift. I'm not pushing that many keys. Control Shift S. Yeah. Yeah, Command Shift. Wow. All right. Well, we'll just probably keep doing it the way I'm doing it. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, so now we've just created a quick little data structure that allows us to house our queues inside of a queue factory, and now both of these guys have access to our queue factory. Make sense? Again, we're drawing pictures, and we're making our code true to those pictures. All right, so now our CPU scheduler is going to be feeding off that queue factory. So he needs to be able to ask the queue factory for the next queue or for, I'm sorry, for the next PCB. So we need to build an ability into our queue factory to always provide the appropriate next PCB. All right, so let's go into queue factory. What does it mean to provide the appropriate PCB? Again, we're gonna make this guy static, right? He needs to be accessible by everybody, so we're not gonna have multiple instances of the queue factory, we're gonna have a single queue factory with queues in it, and he's gonna have this ability where we can knock on the door and say, hey, I need the next PCB. All right, so static PCB get next PCB. All right, so how is this guy going to work? What's the logic for getting the next PCB from our queue factory? Which queue are we going to look in first? Okay. Only interested in the ready queue, right? All right. So job queue, waiting queue, um, uh, completely un unnecessary for these guys. So what we really probably should do is name this guy get next PCB for CPU. Something like that. This is the guys that are ready for the CPU. <coughs> so specifically, we're looking at the ready queue. Yep. Well, actually, let me ask you this. Do we need to write this function in here, or will we write it inside the ready queue? Make an argument why. The ready queue is a generic PSQ. Do all PSQs need to have the ability to get things for a CPU? 
to get PCBs for the CPU. The factory needs to be able to handle requests from the process scheduler as well as the CPU scheduler, right? He needs to be able to handle all those requests. But a PSQ itself doesn't know anything about CPUs or anything like that, right? Okay, so we don't need to give him more to worry about than anything else. So what we'll do here is we're going to keep the function in here. Get next PCB for CPU. The Q factory knows that the appropriate Q for that, the appropriate PSQ for that is the ready Q. So what is it going to do with that? Well, we're going to say, um, well, first of all, we need to know if there's anything in the ready Q. Correct? There's nothing in the ready Q at all. We probably want to go ahead and return null. We'll throw an exception, something along those lines. I got nothing for you. Okay? Now remember, who's going to be calling this function? The person who's going to be calling this function is our CPU scheduler. And this guy needs to be really, 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 really fast. Why? Because he needs to keep this guy busy as close to 100% of the time as possible and minimize context switching or at the very least minimize the amount of time it takes to context switch. All right, so this guy needs to be a speed demon. Christian worldview. Speed demon. <laughs> this coffee is horrible. I think I spilled something in it. Didn't put your ice cream in it? <laughs> no, it tastes like Mountain Dew. <laughs> That's awkward. <laughs> Not just Mountain Dew, coffee with Mountain Dew in it. <laughs> it's not like, oh, my coffee tastes like Mountain Dew, ha ha, because I put Mountain Dew in the mug. No, it's coffee in the mug with potentially additional ingredients. <laughs> oh, was, here's a, a funny side story, I guess. So um, all of you know, well, many of you know Blade, right? Okay, it's a Chinese grad student who comes to all the uh, uh, hackathons and stuff with us. Um, so his mom is in town for like six months right now. She's, I mean, I know some of you think he's from Texas. Totally not from Texas. Really? He's very much from like the heart of China. Oh, all right. Texas accent. <laughs> yeah, it is the Texan accent. I agree. He's got the... <laughs> you should hear him try to make a southern accent. Like, he just does like a really high-pitched voice. That's what he thinks we sound like. <laughs> it's, it is pretty funny actually but anyways his mom's been baking stuff so she, she's she been sending stuff over to my house um, for my wife and she made some sort of a pancake thingy um, I guess like I guess it's like a bread but we don't get any explanation of what these things are for like how we're supposed to eat them <coughs> so for the night my, my we're going on a trip to uh, the Holy Land in Egypt in June so my wife is all stressed out about the squat toilet she might have to use so I told her that the things were actually practice discs, the, <laughs> the squat twins. <laughs> True story. Well, anyways, so she she uh, I, I get the information from Blade that these are actually like supposed to be like for the main meal. It's like a used like a bread. So she's eating them last night, and I guess Blade told his mom to just add as much sugar as she possibly can to stuff because that's what Americans like is sugar. <laughs> and my wife liked it; it was good. So. Um, you know, so she had me ask Blade what, what was in it. So um, Blade says, oh, not much, just uh, sugar, flour, and hemp seeds or something like that. So I'm looking up online, and apparently there's only negligible amounts of THC in this. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, Blade's mom baked my wife some uh, pot. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Bring them in for the class. <laughs> I think she finished them, and then also ordered three pizzas. <laughs> hey, is she less stressed? Now? <laughs> no. <laughs> now the squat toilets are going to be a problem. Plus, we find out that when you go in the 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 trip is really cool. You go from uh, Jerusalem down into Egypt, but by the path of Exodus. This is totally Christian worldview stuff. Okay. So it's really cool, but they send you with like armed guards. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. 
but they say they, they give you like armed guards and things like that, and they 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 do like a a bomb uh, evacuation drill. That's like part of the like. That's part of the tour, just in case you're. Apparently, you have the, like these these desert pirates that uh, that um, you know like take over uh, tourist buses. They get bored, you know. That's food. awesome. Yeah. I hope we totally get. Uh, I mean, I don't want to be one of those beheaded people. You know, I'm not going that far, but I mean, it would be a pretty good story if we like, you know, were you know captured and not treated too terribly, and then you know held for ransom to the <laughs> to the American consulate or something. Please tip your captors away. <laughs> Seriously, so I'm I'm going to bring lots of bacon with me because I'm going to be just doing some converting. Just walk around with you know a little thing of like the bacon sprinkles. Put nope. those on you. Will never get near you. Yeah. So, but my pastor made fun of uh, Tabby, as pastors should do. They should make fun of their parishioners. Um, but uh, yeah, she made fun of Tabby because Tabby was <laughs> talking to him. And she was all stressed out about these squat toilets. And do you know what these are? Like the, yeah. the toilets over there, you just holes in the ground. You gotta. They're not like our toilets where you, you sit ate. and you you know play video games and stuff for an hour. Instead, you're playing. Well, you a go video in, you game. get the job done, because <laughs> it's not like a comfortable place. You're playing a video game, trying to hit the hole. Right, exactly. So she's stressed about that instead of like the the bombs. She's like self bombing. MVP. Yeah, I mean they send you with a cop because there's a reasonable chance pirates are going to invade your bus. She's wondering. She's worried about the squat toilet. Like, oh, what if the what if we get captured? They take us to a squat toilet. <laughs> 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 pretty funny um, she went online she found these little plastic booties that she can carry around <laughs> you put them over your shoes to, uh, to, to block uh, splatter, splatter. <laughs> <laughs> backsplash uh, what's it talking about <laughs> I don't even know anymore alright so we're back here. We've created our Q factory. Our CPU scheduler needs to be really, really, really fast. He's going to request from our Q factory for the next PCB. So our Q factory needs to be able to provide him with that next PCB. So the Q factory is going to know, I need to check the ready queue, and I need to ask the ready queue for the next PCB. So I need to have access to the ready queue's various queues, either directly or indirectly through the PSQ. Okay? Now, the ready queue... Let's see, oh, I want to go back here. Our PSQ. This guy maintains some linked list. And he's going to um, have all those inside of a uh, inside of a, a, a linked list of PCB queues. So what we need to do is we need to give the ability inside of PSQ to get PCB well, let's see with priority kind of a weird naming convention usually you use capitals all over the place but that kind of looks more right all right and this guy is going to take in a what do we call it PCB priority Okay, so he's going to take in a PCB priority, priority, all right, and this guy is going to return this dot the queues dot get priority. That'll get us the appropriate queue dot get. Oh, is it is it not get? Use dot, yeah, <coughs> get an index. So this is going to be uh, um, 
Let me look at PCB priority. How do we write that guy? Oh, it's not going to take an instance of that. It's just going to take it an int. So we're going to take it an int priority. We'll just use PCB priority to pass it in. So this guy will take in an int priority. So we'll get bucket priority. Priority. What, what don't you like? Oh, oh, it's because I'm not done. Not done typing this yet. Dot get, and now we need to get the first element, right? Which is a PCB. So this says, get me the correct queue, then get me the first element from that queue, and return it. I also have a question just about uh, how this is going to work with the priorities. Is it going to be that the, the CPU scheduler is just going to do all of the high priorities, and then when there's no high priorities, it'll try to do them even more? Correct. Okay. Yeah, at least at, for right now. Is that how it would actually work or no? Um, I would say yeah. Uh, but there's a, a much wider range of priorities in a real operating system. Uh, and so, you, you know, it would be less common to have everything uh, backed up into something. And what ends up happening sometimes, and uh, depending on the CPUs, if it's a single-user CPU, I would say it works mostly like this. In a multi-user CPU, what it would end up doing is it would give different time slices to the different priorities and then feed them in a first-come, first-serve order um, or something along those lines. Um, so maybe it always feeds off some sort of very high priority list first, but then everything else is kind of equally handled in terms of when it gets CPU time, but the amount of CPU time it gets is different. So it kind of lets time balance it out. Um, but in ours, we're just kind of trying to create the mechanics uh, of this. Now, an issue we have right here is when we get that next PCB, we want to actually remove it from that line. Okay, so we're not really getting first. We are removing first, which boils down to a PCB. All right, so this will remove the first element from the queue, and I'm assuming remove first should return null. Let's just make sure that's the case. It returns the first element. Right, but does it return null if there's nothing there? Uh, it throws a no such element except, ex exception. Okay, so we'll have to deal with that. So we'll say uh, remove first, like this. So we're going to try to do this. We'll catch a no such element exception E and return null. It, 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 it probably is. Let's see what it's called. Oh, I... no such element exception. That's in java.util, no such element exception. Yep, so we want to import java.util. There we go. So we get a no such element exception, which we're not going to use the exception itself, but better to say this here, since we're writing, you know, now we're, our, this application is getting relatively complex, right? You know, we've written it in little tiny bursts, so it hasn't felt too bad, but we want our code to be relatively self-documenting if we can. So it's certainly going to be beneficial for us to use the no such element exception here rather than just generic exception. And then we're going to go ahead and return null. So we're going to try to return the first element. If an exception occurs, specifically the no such element exception, then we'll return null because there was no element there. Okay? Because whoever called this needs to know if there wasn't a value. Okay, so we've decided that we're going to return null if there is not a value. Okay. Um, now what we... If I were really 
rating this, I might do something like this. I might go into PCB, and I might create a static variable in PCB. Um, and this guy is going to be a static object called PCB null. And he's going to be equal to null. Like that. Um, even though it's uh, uh, just kind of a, a variable that holds the value we're already using, again, self-documenting, instead of returning null, we're going to return PCB dot PCB null. <coughs> it kind of says that there wasn't a PCB. Or maybe PCB not found. Something like that. Maybe that's a good one, PCB not found. Which actually is equal to null under the hood, but we can uh, work with it now inside of our, uh, where were we at, PSQ? Here, instead of returning null, we'll return PCB dot PCB not found. Right, but I actually need I actually need to make this guy not an object. I need to make him a PCB, like that. Otherwise, I have to cast it. So a not found PCB is a PCB whose value is null. So we're going to wrap it inside of a variable called PCB not found. So inside of PSQ, we'll go ahead and return PCB not found, but we couldn't find a PCB. Make sense? All right. So who's going to be calling this guy? Our Q factory. Okay, so our Q factory has been asked to get the next PCB for our CPU. Okay, so what is he going to do? He's going to first check our ready queue. Well, he's only going to check the ready queue, right? So he's going to say, um, actually, let me check something here real quick. This guy tries to get, um, he takes in a priority. Okay, fine. All right, so the first thing we're going to try to do is we're going to try to say Q factory dot the ready queue dot gets PCB with priority, and the priority is going to be PCB underscore priority dot high. Okay, so we'll try to get a high priority first. Then we'll say if the PCB is equal to PCB dot PCB not found, then we'll try to grab. You don't have to. I just have a habit of doing that for, so we don't have uh, spelling errors. But technically, this is in a static context. Therefore, we already have access to all the static members. But I still, I mean, bottom line is if you, if you follow the rule that whenever it says static, we call it with the name of the class in which it was defined, that's never wrong. If it doesn't have it, you call it with an instance of the class in which it's defined. It's never wrong. And then I like to use the class name so it gives me the correct variable names without me having to worry about misspelling it. Uh, and technically, this is a little faster, too because you're not relying on it looking inside of the current context, because it'll check, if we just said ready queue, it'll check inside of this scope first before it jumps to this scope. All right, so we'll try to get the highest priority, PCB. If that PCB is equal to PCB not found, which we happen to know is null, okay, but this reads a little cleaner, right? If it, happened to, if it happens to be equal to that, then what are we gonna do? We're gonna say, get the PCB, from priority normal. If that guy So first of all, yeah, yeah, yeah. If that guy is equal to PCB, PCB not found, 
Then we'll make one last stab and try to get low. Okay, now at the end of the day, after this is done, we have tried to potentially get the high, the normal, and the low. So we've either got a PCB, the appropriate PCB, or we have a PCB not found. Whatever we have, we're going to return the PCB. Okay, it's going to be one of those PCBs. Okay, and we did remove it from the appropriate queue. All right, so now we can ask our queue factory to give me the next PCB for the CPU. So we go back to our picture here. This guy now has the ability to ask this guy for the next PCB to give to this guy. Make sense? So let's go into our CPU scheduler. CPU scheduler is going to uh, probably keep track of several things, but at the very least it needs to keep track of the next PCB. Right now, we're going to ultimately want to make this guy a thread that runs for a period of time. Okay, so we want to think about that CPU scheduler in terms of his job. Okay, what is he actually doing? Remember, this is one of our living entities in our operating system. He's going to go to the Q factory, say, I need the next PCB. Then he's going to hand that PCB off to the CPU, which is maybe a little more complicated than that because a context switch might happen. Yep, he's going to yeah, he's going to have to do all that stuff. That's so it's going to be a little more complicated than that. Then what does he do while that PCB is waiting on the CPU? What does he do? Probably going to go and get the next one, but then he's going to do what once he has it? Okay, so right now I have the next PCB. Okay, so you're the CPU. I've just thrown a PCB at you. You're working on it for five seconds. All right? That's way longer than we're probably working on it, but let's just say it's five seconds. Okay? And I know we're out of time. So I, I have now retrieved the next PCB, so I have it ready. Now I need to go to sleep for the amount of time until I need to go and interact with the CPU again. I need to pause myself. I need to wait because I have nothing else to do right now. My job, my whole job in the world is make sure I can always give PCBs to the CPU. Go ahead. Could you create a CPU, I mean, a queue inside of there so that once the CPU is done with that process, it adds the front, the first one to it so that it, never, it always has stuff ready to go? You could. You could make this guy um, a worker for the CPU. So we'll talk about that next time. How do we actually handle this interaction? But punchline for us right now is this is a living ecosystem right here. Okay, think of this like the heart of your computer. So it's a, you know, blood is pumping to the CPU and out of the CPU, and this is happening between the scheduler and the CPU itself. Okay? All right, I'll see everybody on Monday. No homework. Oh, thank you. No homework, Joel. <laughs>